Hi, my name is John Kennedy, and welcome to interviewing for B2B product management roles. I'm really excited to give this webinar for product school. It's a topic I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. Today, we're going to be focusing on uh, being an interviewee. So, you know, if you today are think about, thinking about, uh, you know, going and finding a new role uh, as a product manager, this is for you. There's a whole range of topics I could talk about if we're going to talk about how to interview um, product managers, if you're, if you're looking for a product manager. But today, we're really going to focus on, on the, uh, the, the skills and some tips uh, if you are uh, an interviewee. So briefly, uh, look at the agenda. We're going to talk about some key questions you should ask uh, yourself uh, and get clear on before you uh, start the interview process. Or if you've already started the interview process, uh, some good questions to think about uh, you know, uh, right now so that you can get clear on broad topics uh, that uh, will help you uh, when you're interviewing as PM. We'll also talk about some general tips for interviewing the essential research uh, that you should be doing on each company before you go and interview with them. Uh, we're going to talk about behavioral interviewing as a, a process um, and what that looks like. Uh, you know, that's a frequently used uh, interview uh, style and process at large companies. And then uh, why and how you should write uh, 12 stories about your career um, and, you know, how that will help you uh, in, the, in the interview process as well. So a little bit about myself, uh, you know, I'm currently head of product for AWS Game Tech uh, for a product there. Uh, you know, I've been building um, cloud technologies for over 20 years now. I've been a developer, a systems engineer, a software development manager, a solutions architect, and a product manager. I've also been a regional director for a Series A startup. Uh, you know, I've been on the leadership team for a field team uh, in a Series E to H, uh, you know, a, a, a later stage startup. Uh, you know, obviously, I've, I'm in a public company right now, and I've also been a founder. I've also, uh, you know, been involved with products across a range of different, uh, you know, uh, functions or industries, including machine learning and digital experience and gaming and a few others as well. Uh, and, you know, over my time um, building products, I've interviewed hundreds of, of potential PM candidates. Uh, for this presentation, I'm really going to focus on the experiences and the learnings I've had interviewing candidates uh, at AWS. And I've, I've interviewed over 60 uh, product manager candidates um, at AWS, uh, at Amazon. Um, and you know, I think that that's, uh, it's been uh, great for me to bring together those learnings. And I, I hope you're uh, interested in uh, learning what I've learned uh, today. So, the big questions you should ask yourself. Um, and we're going to go question by question in, in a second. But as an overview, what is a PM? You know, uh, the definition of a PM changes company to company. And they all may say similar things about the role, but the authority and responsibilities vary dramatically in different companies. Uh, it's important you answer this question yourself and know broadly uh, what could be in the PM role uh, before you start interviewing. What does a PM do best? Uh, some of the best stories that you're going to, uh, you know, form from your career um, are going to be linked to the, the um, unique capabilities that a PM has. So it's really important to be able to answer this question of what is a, uni a PM uniquely suited to do? And then is there such a thing as a generalist PM or are PMs fungible uh, between different uh, product manager roles? Um, you know, this is somewhat of a philosophical question, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that um, if you think about this question and understand uh, where uh, you know a, a company sees you as either a domain expert or a generalist PM, it's going to help you in, in your interviewing. So first up, what is a PM? Um, this framework is by no means definitive. This is something that uh, I use to think about all the capabilities of a PM, um, but there are plenty of other frameworks out there. Um, the way that I think about a PM is a combination of product strategy. So can you go out and have customer conversations and bring it together into a, uh, into a strategy, which could be an uh, Amazon style doc or an 18 month, uh, you know, narrative or a 12 month roadmap or a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but can you bring together all of those customer insights into a strategy? 
Program management, which is really about coordination and stakeholder management. Uh, can you coordinate all the projects going on around a product, whether that be between engineering teams, uh, you know, on uh, topics like compliance or security, or whether it be between external stakeholders like partners um, or other products you're coordinating with around a business and other functions. Um, that's a critical part of product management. Sometimes companies have dedicated program managers who they'll uh, you know, who will uh, work with product managers, but often many of those capabilities uh, fall under the, the product management role. So technical product ownership um, is really your the, the capabilities around the software development process. So, uh, you know, can you lead a sprint view, a sprint planning, a, uh, a stand-up, a retro? Uh, do you understand how agile software development works or the, you know, another framework uh, that you're using uh, works? Can you help engineers make uh, prioritization decisions between uh, two different uh, technical solutions? Obviously, they own the solutions, but then can you help them make those decisions informed by, uh, by customer insight? Um, and then product marketing, all the things like naming and branding and pricing, uh, you know, and writing copy and working, uh, could be working with a marketing team or if you're early on, uh, really driving uh, the product marketing yourself. In larger orgs, uh, influence is going to be critical, the ability to influence people. In smaller orgs, flexibility is going to be critical, uh, grit, the kind of attitude of jumping and owning it and just getting things done. So... Next, let's talk about what uh, a PM can do uniquely. Uh, and you know, the way that I think about this is customer insight. If you were at Amazon, you might call it Am uh, customer obsession. Um, and the way that I break it down is really into to three stages, but uh, these all happen simultaneously. These are happening continuously and all the time uh, if you're a good PM. <laughs> um, you know, you're having customer conversations. You're turning those customer conversations into strategy and voice to the customer so you can go and share those insights with your engineering team, your marketing team, leadership, supporting functions like uh, legal and finance, and then executing, uh, you know, based on that insight, uh, getting things done, working with the support team, working with the, the BD team, uh, working on partnerships uh, or, or uh, you know, writing up strategy. So these things are things that uniquely uh, a PM can do. Um, and you know, overall, I think like the if you had to really boil it down, I would say that PMs help organizations make hard decisions with customer insights. Um, but you know, all of these all of these uh, capabilities are, are kind of integral to that. So for the third question, is a PM, is a B two B PM fungible between domains? Um, you know, this is important when you're going to talk to an interviewer. Is you know, is their perspective on the role that you're interviewing for, is it really important to have domain-specific knowledge or you know, is, uh, are the general PM skills more important? I've had to switch domains multiple times in my career, can be painful. Uh, cloud has been a constant theme, but I've also move, moved, as I said before, between machine learning and uh, you know, e-commerce and gaming, et cetera. And each has given me a sense of respect for its experts and a sense of the common similarities in product management between all of those domains. Um, you know, in a large company, often, you know, the, the philosophy is that you can just pick up a PM and put them somewhere else. Um, but important to know, uh, you know, to know your opinion on that. And so you can talk about how your generalist PM skills uh, interact with your domain specific knowledge that you may have picked up along the way. Things like, you know, if you're in an industry like health, knowing uh, the customer profile and understanding their typical problems in the sales cycle. Uh, that's that's generally used in that industry to sell software or to go to market, and, you know, the marketing strategy, etc. And then on the PM generalist PM side, uh, you know, all the skills we talked about a second ago. Can you uh, can you uh, write an eighteen month plan? Can you gather and interpret uh, metrics that you're gathering from the product? Uh, do you understand the software development process? So some general uh, interview tips. And you know anyone who's been interviewing for a long time uh, knows all of this. I'm absolutely sure, uh, but uh, but good things to remember anyway. Um, interviewing is uh, is by the numbers, and when I say that, I mean that uh, the more interviews, the better. <laughs> generally, <laughs> um, interviewing is a skill, which means like when I start in the past, when I've um, you know gone and had to um, 
think about interviewing uh, as an interviewee, it's taken me at least three interviews before I've really hit my stride uh, because interviewing is actually a skill you lose while you're not interviewing. Um, so having lots of interviews is going to, to help you skill up, um, you know, and you're going to have better and better interviews. Um, each interview is a data point and, you know, you're going to understand the salary expectations and the role title expectations of your level of experience as you have more and more interviews. And then obviously more offers, more leverage. Um, this has really helped me in my career negotiate offers as if I have a counter offer. Um, so it's tempting to just, you know, once you've scheduled your first interview to kind of stop there and for that to be the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the thing that you wait for, but, uh, it's so important to schedule lots of interviews um, so you can kind of gather the data and, uh, and skill up on interviewing, which is a very distinct skill versus, you know, being a PM um, and then, you know, getting leverage. But uh, each interview also deserves research. Um, and each is an opportunity to learn about the business, but all about, also about how people think about, uh, you know, how PMs should operate um, and, uh, you know, and trends they're seeing in the industry and these kinds of things. So let's talk about all the research that uh, is good to do before you go and talk to a company. So, uh, you know, the first thing that I, uh, I think about um, is what's their unique value? What are the three biggest problems they're solving for customers? And you find this on their website. Um, you know, if you, if you kind of look into their messaging, you should be able to decipher uh, what they think the problems are that they're solving with their products or, you know, and how, how they uh, solve those problems. Is it, a, is it strictly products? Is it services? Is it a combination in solutions? Um, it's really un important to understand their, you know, their idea of delivery and how they deliver value to customers. Even better is to try out their product. This is not always possible with a B2B, uh, you know, SaaS product. Um, but if you can try it out, if not, uh, you know, maybe watch a YouTube video of someone using the product or uh, talk to someone who you know who, who's used the product. Um, that's still very worth doing uh, before you go into the interview process. Secondarily, knowing their go-to-market, you know, knowing uh, th how they're doing enterprise sales or are they using marketing channels or do they have a channel sales team? Have they got a partnership network? Um, do they sell primarily through partners? How large is their market? You know, as a PM, your opportunity is really tied to their opportunity as a company. So it just shows your professionalism to understand the size of their opportunity uh, and that you've done uh, good research and you care about your career. Um, by doing that research. So understanding, you know, their TAM or the, the size of their market, maybe their customer segment, um, their, their optimal customer, um, and then the competition they might have in their market. So the final one, how is their team structured, is usually pretty hard to get a hold of, but if you have an insider contact or you're just really good at deep research, this is a great one to do as well. You know, are they product-led? Are they primarily developing features to, uh, to gain organic adoption or are they sales and marketing-led? You know, what's the approach they take? How do they break down their product responsibilities? Um, you know, is is a pro, is a PM you know from that chart we looked at before? Are they primarily focused on strategy, or are they you know, or are they doing a lot of program management, or a lot of product marketing, or are there dedicated people for product management, uh, product marketing, and program management, uh, and uh, maybe even technical product ownership with people in the engineering team? How do the product responsibilities break down? And then how large is the product team versus the engineering team? Is it you know two PMs? Uh, to to uh, six products with uh, you know a hundred on the team on the engineering team, or is it uh, six PMs to two products, uh, you know, with fifty on the team? It's really important to understand that balance because it'll give you an idea of uh, the responsibilities that you'll be taking on uh, and the ownership that you can have and the results that you can have for the business. All righty, stories are powerful. Um, we're now going to talk about uh, why stories are really important um, as an interviewee uh, to tell the story of your career. So stories are memorable, they're relatable, they engage our brains because they encourage us to do the thing that our brains were designed to do, which is prediction. <laughs> um, you know, the surprise of being wrong uh, when you're being told a story elicits emotions. And we remember those emotions. So when you get that prediction wrong, it really locks it into your brain as a learning. So when you get to the interview stage, you're probably there because uh, the company has formed a picture of who you are and they want to confirm that. And in average companies, your best bet is to help them confirm that. 
But in the best companies, they're looking for something unexpected that puts you ahead of the pack. And at Amazon, we would call that raising the bar. Telling stories can be the most memorable way to explain what makes you unique and bar raising. Um, and, you know, and one trick you can use to tell a compelling story is to include a surprise, um, a surprise that could be a learning that you had uh, during the story. It could be um, something that's counterintuitive, but that will really lock it in in their memories. Uh, too many surprises uh, seem, makes you seem chaotic. Uh, no surprises elicit no emotions and makes the story unmemorable, but having a really good learning in a story will make it memorable. Um, additionally, the best way to bring the listener along is to make it relatable to them. So we're going to talk about how you can form stories about your career, but in the relation of those stories and the telling of those stories, it's also really important to remember who you're talking to. Are you talking to a software engineer who's going to be really interested in the technical details, or are you talking to leadership who are going to be in, interested in the impact uh, to the business or more interested? I think they're both, you know, it's still worth telling all the important points of the story, but important to remember who you're talking to. So great, <clears throat> stories are powerful, what do we do with that? Well, first let's talk about how an interview might ask you to tell a story. Behavioral interviewing um, is a, an interviewing technique and process that a lot of large companies uh, use to, uh, to interview prospective uh, product managers. Behavioral interviewing is designed to elicit stories. Um, and, uh, you know, as a primer, um, it, the, the behaviors that uh, they could be uh, interested in, you know, for instance, at Amazon, it might be the Amazon principle of ownership. Um, you know, there's a range of different behaviors that companies could be looking for. Um, or it could be framed as a question about a skill like road mapping or hiring or data analysis. Um, you know, often these questions are open questions. Um, so let's talk about how to prepare to answer a behavior, a behavioral question that's that's uh, asked as um, an open question and, and is designed to elicit your experience and your decision making process and your adaptability and how you uh, how you handle changes. Um, so, when you're asked a question, uh, one of these open questions, uh, that's really it's not. Generally, they stay away from hypotheticals, or we stay away from hypotheticals. We're really asking for a really specific situation in your career. The best way to answer the question is to answer um, with a structured story. And a great way to structure a story is, uh, is the star format. So situation, task, action, result. The situation is all the context around the story. The task is the task you were given to do, or you owned, or you knew was the task. The action is what happened, uh, you know, during uh, the, the period of the story? And then what was the result? What was the impact for the business? When you're thinking about um, how to come up um, with, uh, with 12 stories, um, you should have a filter uh, on the, the stories that you can come up with in your career. And, you know, one of the filters uh, should, that you should have should be the impact. Um, if it's low impact, it's not worth telling uh, the story. The impact has to be high on the axis of um, business impact, business metrics, or the impact to your career, or the impact to your team, or the impact to the career of someone on your team or your manager. Um, the, the, those are the kinds of imp, uh, you know the types of impact uh, that an interviewer is really going to care about. It's also really important to filter on uh, on stories that you. Uh, where you can really explain the detail, where you were the main character, where you were uh, owning uh, what was happening, uh, at least in some facet, um, because you're going to have to explain the context and the trade-offs. Um, you know, you're going to have to potentially explain um, disagreements that may have happened. So it's really important that you have the detail, um, and that's one of the other great reasons. It's uh, you know another great reason to actually write it down and uh, and and get that detail. So I've. I'm going to give you a set of prompts to help you write uh, these 12 stories. Uh, but first, I want to uh, talk about an overall principle about writing these stories. And that is uh, above the line behavior. So, um, you know, the term above the line behavior um, is in relation to ownership and accountability that comes 
from a model of personal responsibility often used in leadership development and management training and personal growth. Uh, it's typically represented by this horizontal dotted line. You can see I've, I've put across the page that separates positive above the line behavior from negative below the line behavior um, in response to situations and challenges and, and issues. Above the line behavior includes taking ownership, being accountable, um, taking responsibility for one's actions. It represents proactive solution-oriented behavior where individuals acknowledge their role in situations and take steps to address or improve their own behavior. Below the line behaviors, on the other hand, include blaming others, um, making excuses, denying one's role or responsibility. It represents reactive or problem-focused behavior where individuals avoid taking personal accountability and instead deflect or evade responsibility. The idea of kind of framing it this way and thinking about above the line behavior um, is to encourage individuals and teams to live above the line and to choose to respond to a challenge in a way that promotes personal accountability and ownership and positive growth um, or a growth mindset. Um, it's about recognizing that while we can't always control what happens to us, we can control how we choose to respond. And when you're framing your stories, when you're writing down your stories um, that, that you can then use to, uh, to talk to interviewers and to answer questions, um, it's really important to have the framing of ownership, uh, to use the language um, of ownership, um, such as, you know, I choose, I prefer, I will, I can, I did, explaining what you did and your ownership over the situation rather than the language of, of blame. You know, I, I have to, I can't, I must, if only it wasn't possible. That's all, all of that language is really disempowered language. Um, so if possible, you should think about each of your stories in terms of your own growth. Um, and it's great to, to share learnings that you've had um, as you share stories. Um, so, uh, right, let's get to the 12 stories. I've been having a lot of fun recently with ChatGPT um, to the point where I've gotten really used to coming up with prompts. And so what I've done is I've created 12 prompts uh, for interview stories that you can use to form up uh, these little star format stories that you can write down to, uh, you know, to make sure that you've got the detail, to make sure you're the main character, to make sure that those stories had impact. Um, and I absolutely do not suggest asking ChatGPT to answer these for you. Uh, the answer should be real and not from a simulated version of yourself uh, that uh, ChatGPT hallucinates. Um, uh, but, you know, the, and the prompts that I'm going to give you are, are not definitive. If you are interviewing for, for a specific company, it's worth going to their website, checking out what they see as a really important um, important parts of their vision and then kind of coming up with prompts that relate to that. Um, but here's, a, here's 12 prompts um, that uh, should be helpful uh, to come up with an initial set of stories that you can write down. Ownership. Uh, great topic to begin with. We we're just talking about ownership, but it's great to have a story which really relates to ownership. So a question that you might get is, can you tell me about a time you owned an outcome over and above the responsibilities of your normal role? And then an interviewer might dig into that with, did you deliver <laughs> against that project? And what did that uh, delivery lead to? What was the impact you know, for, for the entire company? So, you know, being able to describe a situation, we can really describe your own strong ownership. So important, just about for every interview that you ever do. Customers, um, you know, have you ever gone over and above uh, your role for a customer? Um, you know, can you demonstrate uh, customer obsession? Um, what did you learn about the customer? What, uh, what outcome was there for the customer? Um, having some really customer-oriented uh, stories is uh, is great uh, because that is, as I said before, really the key uh, capability that a PM has over over anyone else. Um, disagreements. This is one uh, you know. It's kind of like the question. Uh, you know, what's what? What are your worst? You know, what what are your weaknesses? It's it's really hard uh, personally to go off and uh, answer this question, but it's so important um, to have an example of this um, in case. Uh, in case this question is asked, it's great if you've got a story that you can tell about this. So as an example, can you talk about a time when you disagreed with your manager? What happened? What have you done differently? And it really comes back to, uh, to ownership and the way that you think about disagreements and the way that you think about uh, your learnings. 
strategy. Um, you know, obviously this is more of a this is more of a skill for a PM than a behavior. It's still really important to be able to talk about a time when you've owned a strategy or you've contributed to a strategy. Um, you know, what research did you do to, to come to that conclusion, to build that strategy? Were your assumptions correct? Um, you know, was that strategy net positive? Uh, really important to, to think about all of those for a story that you form up around strategy. Technical, this obviously varies between whether you're a PMT or a PM, um, but uh, either way, uh, great to have a story in your back pocket about talking about a time you helped a, a technical team, an engineering team, make a decision between two different options um, and going deeply into the solution that you came up with and the trade-offs uh, you know, with that solution. For large organization, you know, stakeholder management, super critical, really for everyone, but it really comes to the fore um, for large organizations. So having a story there is, is, a, is a great idea. What, were the, what was the greatest amount of, uh, greatest number of stakeholders you've ever had to manage? What does best practice look like in terms of stakeholder management? Risk. So, you know, um, risk is super important for product managers, always making priority decisions, always having to act on, on insufficient data. Uh, can you talk about a time that you have had, had to take a calculated risk? It's a really good, it's a good prompt uh, for you to come up with um, something that shows uh, how you take action in a situation. Uh, you know, what research did you do to show that you're not foolhardy, you're still, you know, you're st still um, doing risk management, um, but you're able to move forward uh, quickly. Trust, so important to earn trust with your, uh, with your engineering team and with your leadership and with customers. Great to have, have a story or a couple of stories around earning trust. Um, data, once again, more of a skill than a behavior, but still great to have a story around this. If you can, you, often, you know, uh, you're gonna be asked uh, functional questions, uh, skill-based questions in interviews. So great to have a story around how you've been able to gather data, interpret data, uh, you know, take insights, uh, form a narrative around that data. Big ideas. As a PM, you know, when you're writing strategy, it's so important to be able to see the bigger picture and potentially, you know, bring a bigger idea to your greater team to inspire them, to give them a direction for the future. Um, you know, a, an ambitious idea uh, that, uh, that takes important insights from customers uh, in your industry and what's going on with the product development and, and paints a picture, a picture of the future. And then if you are uh, interfering for a manager role, obviously really important to cover things like hiring and mentoring, having stories here um, can be really important, less important for IC roles, but if you're in an IC role or interfering for an IC role where, uh, it's, sorry, individual contributor role, where you are um, thinking about uh, leadership or management, these are really important as well. So obviously, or not obviously, but hopefully on it, uh, obviously, Honesty is, uh, is crucial with all of these stories. You have to be able to um, really honestly answer hard questions about these. No one's asking you to reveal proprietary uh, details, but uh, you know, um, it's crucial to earning trust that you're really uh, answer, you, you're, you're telling stories that are uh, fully formed where you can give the details and, uh, and really kind of give the nuts and bolts of how you acted and uh, the learnings that you had in each of those situations. Now, uh, apart from all of those stories that we're forming up, um, just as, as a bonus round, sometimes uh, companies will ask you impossible questions. I've specifically had the logistics question asked of me, how would you organize logistics to most efficiently deliver large items to the continental US? Uh, I think the important thing to, to remember here, whether it's you know, this kind of question or the future prediction question or the Peter Thiel question, any of these types of impossible questions, it's really just important to show your uh, your uh, unique expertise and how you would apply that expertise to the impossible question and then step through the process uh, that you would go through. So these come your way. I don't think it's critical to prepare for them, um, but good to know that they exist so that you're not thrown off and you know that when you are hit with one of these questions, um, you know, you can just use, use your experience to explain how you would uh, step through these questions. Okay, bonus, bonus round. Uh, these are probably super obvious, but worth uh, re-mentioning again, uh, get good sleep. <laughs> uh, that's probably the most critical thing of all the preparation. Um, know the schedule, uh, that really shows that you've prepared and you care about their time and then arrive early uh, because uh, early is on time and on time is late. All right.
Thank you for attending uh, the webinar. Um, I'd really love your feedback. Um, and if you want to reach out and ask more questions, there's my, uh, there's my uh, LinkedIn contact. Um, and uh, I hope that's, that's helped.